Now we move into this chapter, chapter 9, dealing with free convection. Some people will call this natural convection. So it's the heat transfer from a solid surface into the flowing fluid, but the motion, what causes the fluid to move, is not a pump or a fan, it's just buoyancy driven flow. So it's where you have density changing in a gravitational field so that you have maybe light fluid over here, less dense fluid, and you have heavier fluid over here, cooler fluid typically, and the hot, lighter fluid buoys up and the cooler, denser fluid sinks. Hot air rises, cold air sinks. There you go, that's buoyancy driven flow. Uh, this is a long chapter. Um, we're gonna skim the, and, and cover it in one day, one lecture, that's all I can afford. I wish we'd spend more time on it. You could spend a lot more time on it. It gets very mathematical and you'll see that very quickly. Let's jump into it. All right, so natural or free convection, you have a gravitational field, G, and then you have density as a function of temperature. So where do we, what type of substance has density as a function of temperature? One is gases especially ideal gases. And so what is the ideal gas equation? There's a couple forms. PV is equal to NR bar T. And then you could put it like this. You could put PV is equal to MRT, where R is R bar divided by the motor mass. And then you could put P is equal to rho RT, mass density is mass per unit volume. And then rho is equal to P divided by RT. Here you see exactly the relationship between the mass density and the temperature. It's inversely proportional to the temperature. And so hot air rises because it's less dense and cold air sinks in the gravitational field. We start with a hot knife edged vertical plate. So the vertical plate's very thin and it has a starting point right here. And the coordinate system that the book uses and most books use, they flip it around a little bit. It's a little hard when you first see it, but that's the starting point of the knife edge plate. They're only gonna focus on one side and they're gonna put this as a coordinate system X going up. Oh yeah, oh yeah. And then they put Y going out. So it takes you a little bit to get oriented, but they wanna talk about the velocity U as a function of y at any location x. So what happens is, is we're, we can focus on both sides of the plate, but they just focus on the right side of the plate. If you come out here far into the fluid, it's all at a fluid temperature of T infinity. Far away from the hot plate, it's some quiescent fluid. It's not moving, U infinity is equal to zero, uh, some given temperature, and you have the gravity, G operating down. Okay. Well, what's going to happen is, is the fluid right close to the plate is going to become warmer because of conduction. Then it starts to buoy up. Now you have it sweeping past the hot plate. Now you have the conduction and convection. And so what you have is the development of a layer where inside that layer, U is not equal to zero. It's not quiescent. It's buoying up. So it takes a while to really plot u, but let's pick this vac value of x and go out to y infinity. If we say way out here at that location, what is the upward directed speed of the fluid flow? Well, it's stationary, it's stagnant, so it's zero. Well, then it's zero, and it's zero, and it's zero, and it's zero, and so as you come closer and closer, it's all zero, but this thickness right here is known as the velocity or momentum boundary layer thickness. It's where it's actually now starting to creep up above the free stream. It's not quite the free stream. And so it actually would be like this. Now, way over here, you have no slip. So it's like zero way out here. It's zero right there because of no slip. Now, what happens in, inside the boundary layer? <sighs> yeah, it's going to be steep near the wall and then kind of cut out like that. And that's our velocity profile. It's more challenging, more uh, difficult to uh, think about 
as well as to numerically or analytically evaluate. But that's the velocity profile. You go up a little further, it has ten, this, the same shape. Well, once you get the velocity profile down, and you have the concept of the growing delta, the boundary layer thickness, then you go over and you could draw it on the same plot, but it gets a little confusing. So re just replot x and y. Here's the beginning of the knife edge plate. And think about this being hot. What's the temperature look like? Well, if I come up to this location right here and I plot the temperature way out here, I'm going to kind of show temperature in that scale. This would be T infinity. Maybe I draw it a little lower, but whatever. It's, it's constant uniform temperature everywhere. But when you get close to the plate, what's the temperature? It's higher. It's, it's TS. So we have this growing boundary layer. I'm going to show it to be about the same thickness, the growing at the same rate as the velocity boundary layer. Um, maybe I need to move this up a little bit. No, that's fine. It's okay. Okay. So what's the temperature do? It, it's going to come in here. And then it's got to get up to here. Does it, does it do something crazy like that? No. It's actually pretty boring. And actually, sometimes in our life, we just like boredom. We like simplicity. Right. It's not that complicated. Okay? It just slopes off. But uh, this is the thickness right here of the thermal boundary layer. So we have a growing velocity boundary layer, a growing um, thermal boundary layer. The speed, you know, is changing as at different locations, x going up. This is u right here as a function of y at that location x. Okay, so that's an introduction. We have three equations, continuity, conservation of mass, momentum, and then we have energy. Now, momentum has x component, y component. If you focus on the x component of the momentum equation, I don't know if I have enough room, let me try and write it. x component of the momentum, remember the x is in that positive y or upward direction. Okay, you get that, you hit rho u partial of u with respect to x plus v partial u with respect to y equal to minus the partial of p with respect to x minus rho g plus mu partial second u with respect to y squared. Let's try and understand each of these terms. Probably this term right here is the easiest. In words, why do we have a, a rho g in there? Because everywhere there's a body force known as gravity, and it's acting downward. And so it's a minus rho g. Okay, uh, maybe this is the second easiest term. What does that represent? The viscous effects, such that a fast layer of fluid next to a slower layer of fluid, the fast will, will have a force to sort of accelerate it, and the slow will decelerate the faster, the shear stress. All right, what is this one? Well, if you have a pressure gradient pushing it along in the x direction, or a negative pressure gradient, we're going to work on that term in a minute. Did you have a question? No, I was going to ask that. Oh, okay, you're going to answer it. How about this one? What does this term represent? the last one in our momentum equation. It's like oh, everything over here is the sum of the forces. Then you have the MA. It's how things are accelerating. What is the change in the momentum due to an imbalance in the forces? So that as, think about it, if you just had a little fluid packet and you traced it, it would kind of get swept up in this buoyancy-driven flow. It would be swept up and then, okay. Okay, now uh, if we spend a little time, let me scroll down, with the y momentum equation, and a book does, I think, a pretty good job of this, it, it, there's a few steps in the logic, but what you conclude is, is way out that the, the, the dp, the p dy is equal to zero, meaning that there's that the pressure is not a function of location in the y, it's only a function of location in the x, how high it is in the gravitational field, in the direction of the field. So that you change this partial derivative into an ordinary derivative, dp dx. And then you think, 
will it be easy to evaluate the PDX inside the boundary layer or outside the boundary layer? Well, outside the boundary layer, rho is equal to rho infinity. It's just the, the, the ambient uh, density of the fluid. And so dpdx is equal to minus um, rho infinity g. What? Where did that come from? Well, from the y momentum equation. And uh, essentially, it's pretty simple. Uh, or the, the one in the, in the y direction or in the gravity direction. This is just like hydrostatics. Hydrostatics, that's all. Okay, so, all right, so what we do is um, dp dx is equal to dp infinity dx, which is equal to minus rho infinity g, and now you can substitute for that term in the equation, and then you can uh, group it together. So I'm going to just rewrite u is equal to u, partial u with respect to x plus v, partial u with respect to y, equal to... And then we pick up a rho infinity minus rho times g. Now we have this mu, second derivative of u with respect to um, the y squared. I don't know where the y went. Okay. At this point, they divide by rho, rho, rho. So these cancel right here. You have this group of terms we're going to work on in a minute. And what is this one known as? A different viscosity. We go from absolute viscosity to the kinematic. That's right, kinematic viscosity. That's the symbol nu. Kinematic viscosity, mu over rho. <coughs> All right, now let's talk about this group of terms for a second. Well, they introduced the term, the volumetric thermal expansion coefficient. It's a parameter. Defined for all substances, solids, liquids, gases, it's defined as negative 1 over the mass density times the rate of change of the mass density with respect to temperature holding pressure constant. You think, well, how does that help us? Well, just bear with us a minute here. Okay, so that's a definition of the volumetric thermal expansion coefficient. Think about it as rho as a function of temperature. Doesn't rho as a function of temperature typically go down? Yeah, it typically is. It's, as you increase temperature, gases and a lot of other substances become less dense at the constant pressure. So again, this is all P is equal to a constant pressure. Okay, think about coming in here and I'm going to say, well, right here is T infinity, and right there is rho infinity. And now I'm thinking about changing the temperature to some new value, T. And what will that do to rho? It'll drop it to a new value, rho. So if somebody said, what is the partial of rho with respect to T holding P constant? It's just a finite difference, so the approximation to the derivative. It would be rho minus rho infinity divided by T minus T infinity or you could switch it around either way, right? Is that equation that looks good? It's approximation. This is approximately equal to, and it's good as if you have a small delta t. All right. So let's do this. Let's, uh, um, if you switch this order, then you get a negative sign. I could use this result right here, equal to 1 over rho, rho infinity minus rho, I got rid of the negative sign, t minus t infinity. Does that look okay? There's a couple ways to approach this. So now, if I'm looking for an expression, here I'm going to change color, I want rho infinity minus rho divided by rho. That's equal to beta times t minus t infinity. That's a big conclusion that we wanted to get to. So in our momentum equation, we can replace that term with the volumetric expansion coefficient times the temperature difference from the ambient temperature. Okay, so let me see if I have it on the next slide. Well, what I did was I wrote out, at this point I need to just summarize because you'll, 
if I haven't lost you already, you're about ready to get lost, right? Mm -hmm. So we have the continuity equation. We have the modified uh, momentum equation. How did it get modified? See that G beta delta T, T minus T infinity? So we used the volumetric expansion coefficient and simplified that term right there. And then we have new, that viscous term. What is this last equation right here? That's our energy equation. So it's just like forced flow. We have continuity, we have momentum, at least one momentum uh, in the x direction, and then we have energy. Well, there's a lot of dot, dot, dot with W-O-R-K that really is challenging because what they do is they introduce and transform the variables and they pick very judiciously some scaling. It's like they're going to say, well, u asterisk is u divided by some u naught, but I don't have any given speed, like a mean speed of the flow to normalize it with. But after they work with it a while, they say, you know what? u naught squared is equal to g beta t minus t infinity l. Some genius, you know, people that worked that on. I'm not going to try and say that it's obvious. It's just that people worked on this and found that this is a good scaling. So they transform the momentum equation and they get dimensionless, this all dimensionless, and then they get this term right here, and then they get one over a group of parameters, and they call it the Grashof number. And the Grashof number right here is g beta t minus t infinity l cubed over nu squared. They also transform the energy equation. You get the advection, and you get this dimensionless grouping of terms, one over Grashof times the Pranel. And so the Rayleigh number is defined as the Grashof times the Pranel. And actually, probably more than half of the equations are set out in terms of the Gra Rayleigh number, not the Grashof in convection correlations. You'll see that. So that's G beta delta T, T minus some, I'll just put delta T that's driving the flow. And then you have L cubed divided by nu alpha. Only difference, instead of nu squared, you have nu alpha, because what is Pranel number? The Pranel number is simply nu over alpha. It just replaces one of the nus with an alpha in a denominator. So the game is, if, I know it's hard to see, but it's like, oh, I have an abstract Nusselt number associated with what's happening at the boundary. And it can be represented in terms of the dimensionless Rayleigh number and Pranel number. Well, if you want to follow the textbook, they introduced a stream function, a similarity variable. They cast that momentum equation. Now it's so abstract, third order ODE. What is this? And then you also put in the energy equation. And it needs the solution from the momentum equation in it. But then people have numerically solved it for a range of Pranel number, and they plotted it. And this funny plotting of parameter does look something like the velocity profile, as well as the thermal profile in the boundary, in the boundary layer. So kind of a analog, an analytical approach coupled with numerical solution to some difficult ODEs has gone a long way. But when they want to uh, put together a correlation, that helps suggest the framework. We're looking for a Nusselt as a function of get me the right geometry, just like when we had force convection. Don't, don't do flow inside a pipe as equivalent to the same correlation for flow over the pipe, external flow, no. Okay, the right geometry. And then we're going to look for Rayleigh number, Pranel number, Mm, that's about it. There could be a friction factor or some other term in it, but we'll close it right there. And so then they have, okay, here's a vertical plate, and we're going to give you this correlation, and it's good for all Rayleigh numbers. Okay, and you can see it's a constant, constant. Where did these constants come from? Curve-fitting experimental data and a lot of it. Here's our Rayleigh number. Here's our Pranel number. So the theory suggests the form, and then experimental data gives us the structure of that equation. Now, here's another one for the same problem, vertical plate. But here's the restriction that it's less than 10 to the 9. Why is it less than 10 to the 9? Because the Rayleigh number, based on the height where x 
x critical is equal to 10 to the 9. That's where the transition is spermally. It's been found to occur between laminar and turbulent flow. Yes, you can get turbulent natural convection. Often you get laminar natural convection. Now, why would you use this one instead of that one? They say this one is a little more accurate. Uh, on an exam, this one will work for all Rayleigh numbers. Go for it. Okay. I think the equation sheet, both of these are given. So you're going to have to kind of look at your equation sheet and become familiar with it before the exam. Don't. Yeah, this is curve fit, but it's curve fit for laminar flow data, and they say it's a little more accurate for laminar flow data. But all these correlations have a large uncertainty, so that what's a little more accurate when you have a large uncertainty anyway. So, okay, guess what? The chapter is filled with different configurations and different correlations. And pay attention to the restrictions on the correlations so that you use them within the bounds of the restrictions. So this is a horizontal cylinder, a sphere, and there you go, different forms. All right. Uh, if I had more time, I would explain why there's a two definitely there. I'd also go back and take a look at why these are very consistent. But uh, in the interest of time, I don't know if you'd appreciate those little nuances. The structure is there. I can get a Nusselt number if I can calculate the Rayleigh and the Prandtl number and know the geometry. Here they have it where, okay, we can have a very simple form where the Nusselt is a constant Rayleigh to a power, okay, like, what is that, N or an M? Can't see. An N, okay, sometimes they use M. This is an exponent N. And depending on the range of the Rayleigh number, here's the bright C and the right N. Very easy to use. Or, guess what? Somebody curved at the whole range, going out to 10 to the 12th. And so you can use this. It's, they should compare pretty well. So, again, you have choices. All right. Uh, also, they don't, I don't emphasize like going theta equal to zero all the way around here to the backside or pi. But the local Nusselt number, yeah, it's a function of the location as you go around. We're just happy to get an average Nusselt number for the area around that sphere or cylinder. All right, so for an ideal gas, we want to actually compute beta. So I think the ideal gas, we already did that rho is equal to P divided by RT. True? We just did that. Sometimes I'll write it like this. P molar mass divided by R bar T. Instead of R, I have R bar, the universal gas constant, then I need to know the molar mass of air. Okay. Can you take and differentiate rho with respect to T holding pressure constant? Well, the P is constant, the molar mass is constant, the universal gas constant is constant, so I have to differentiate 1 over T with respect to T, negative 1 over T squared. All those calculus classes, right? <laughs> so now I take that result, stick it in here. So that's negative P molar mass over R bar T squared. Then I multiply by negative 1 over rho. 1 over rho is P, oops, P molar mass over R bar T. The two negatives turn into a positive. The pressures cancel, the molar masses cancel, the R bars cancel, and one of the temperatures cancel. And so for an ideal gas, And students just love that equation. They, oh, this is simple. Beta, the thermal expansion coefficient for an ideal gas, is 1 over T. Now, I want to save you. I do not want to see any of these errors on the final exam. Let me tell you two of them. One of them, somebody will say, oh, I found that I have to evaluate this at the film temperature of uh, 30 degrees C. I need beta at 30 degrees C. Beta is 1 over 30. Why is that wrong? Why is it beta is 1 over 30 plus 273 correct? 
because the equation that you started with for the ideal gas, density is the ideal gas equation. It expects and needs and demands the absolute temperature, not the relative temperature. So it goes back to that little starting point of what the ideal gas equation is. So don't put anything like 1 over degree C. It's convert to K, put that in, and the units of this is 1 over Kelvin. Okay, the other one, somebody says, I'm working with water. Can I have natural convection with water? Yes, I, I can have buoyancy in water. It won't be as strong, typically, as buoyancy in gases. Gases really expand when they get hot and contract when they get cold. But water does the same thing. There's some buoyancy-driven flow. And they'll say, okay, for water, great. Beta is equal to 1 over T. Why is that wrong? Water is definitely not an ideal gas, right? But we fall in love with this equation, and we want to use it day and night. We want to use it for liquids. We want to use it for gases. Use it for gases only, ideal gases only, okay? Somebody says, I'm, I'm forced to solve a problem where I need to get this parameter beta for water. Where am I going to get it? Guess where you get it? The same table where you get the thermal conductivity or the diffusivity or the viscosity of water. And yeah, I know it's hard to see, but it's this column right over here. That's the expansion coefficient beta times 10 to the 6. So here's a clicker question for you. I'm looking at the temperature 290. And I read across the table, and I see this value 174. And I look up at the header of the column, and I see beta times 10 to the 6 in inverse Kelvin. And so the clicker question is, is, what should I bring down for beta? Should I say beta is equal to 174 inverse Kelvin or 0. 0.000174 inverse Kelvin or 174 times 10 to the 6 inverse Kelvin? All right, let me do this. I'm going to ask another question. If I said that I want to get the beta for air at ideal gas air, at 290 Kelvin, what value would you put? 1 over 290. Can you run your calculator? Give that to me, one person who's a calculator. 0 0.00345 inverse Kelvin, right? Is that right? Yeah. All right. Is that good? Okay. Would you expect beta to be smaller for a less thermally expansive substance like water? Yeah. So that's a little hint. So I would expect uh, the beta for water to be less than the beta for air. And what did we say the beta for air is? That value. Same question, another 30 seconds. I want to see if I can get 100% correct. Back to what is the thermal expansion coefficient for liquid water at 290, A, B, or C? All right, so a couple of you need to absolutely guard your uh, clicker response system because your friend is poking, and they're poking on your keyboard as soon as you, you know, turn your back. They're reaching over. I've seen that done before. Okay. But let's see how we did compared to the first time. Well, most of you were still right, but I, I couldn't get 100%. All right, I tried. All right? So when you see this, you just have to know, okay, what I'm, you, I'm expecting a really small number here, so I multiply by 10 to the minus 6, and this is 174 times 10 to the minus 6. Uh, here's another clicker question. The thermal expansion coefficient is always greater than or equal to zero. What was the definition of beta? Negative 1 over rho, partial of rho with respect to T at constant P. Is that always positive? All right. So what's the clue here that people said, no, I think it can be negative. What did you do? Yeah, don't, don't focus on this complex equation that I just threw out there. Focus on this right there. Right? And you say to yourself, hey, this is negative. 
What's happening here? Well, this is not on the final exam, but I hope that I can just spend a few minutes and you appreciate it. We should know something about the most plentiful liquid around here on the planet, right? Water. And one of the things that you know is when you have a glass of water in the summer, you want to put a little ice cube in it. You put the ice cube in and it sinks to the bottom of your glass of water. Does it not or not? No, it floats. It floats. It floats. The water, the ice cube floats. The ice cube is water. The liquid water is water. But some low, solid, you know, it freezes. It expands on freezing. And that's really unique. But where is, at what temperature is liquid water the most dense? Neg at 4 degrees C. At 4 degrees C. It's kind of a very interesting fact that there is a peak there. It's maximum density, and it's almost 1,000, but we round off to 1,000 kilograms per cubic meter. Now, out here, this is where everything in your intuition is, your intuition's happy. Because as water gets warmer, it becomes less dense. So your intuition is happy. The warm water is going to buoy up, and the cold water is going to sink. But what happens between zero and four degrees. If I warm the water up, let's say from one to three degrees C, what happens to the density? That means the warmer water, I know three degrees C is not very warm, compared to the cold water, one degree C, is more dense. It's going to do just the opposite. The warm water is going to sink and the cold water is going to go to the top. But this is really important in lakes. Not in Texas, but in Minnesota, some place where they have winter. Because they have a lake, and as the water gets cold and cold and cold, it all essentially gets really, really cold. But then the cold water collects at the top, because doesn't the lake freeze from the top down and not from the bottom up? And down here may be like 3 or 4 degrees C or 2 degrees C, and then up here 0 degrees C, and it's freezing. True? So you're not, this is not on the final exam. I hope you enjoyed it. Let's move on. Put it on the final exam. Let's solve this problem. We have a 200 millimeter diameter and one millimeter thick silicon wafer. And uh, so the wafer is like this, little thickness to it. And it's actually horizontally oriented. I forgot to emphasize that. It's a horizontal horizontally oriented. It's not like a vertical. It's a horizontal wafer. And initially the temperature is uh, 280 degrees C. That's the temperature initial of the wafer. And it's allowed to cool in a quiescent ambient air where the temperature of the ambient air far away around it, T infinity, is 75 degrees C. This is a made-up problem, okay? The wafer cools by natural convection and thermal radiation, both. Often when you have cooling by natural convection, something, especially at elevated temperatures like this, thermal radiation is not negligible. It can be very important, and it will be in this case. So you have it both from the top and the bottom uh, of the wafer. The emissivity for the thermal radiation is 0.7 for the wafer. And the large surroundings, so the temperature of the surroundings is equal to the temperature of the air, which is 75 degrees C. So there's not like the walls that are a different temperature of the surrounding than the air in the room. So the air in the room and the walls and the ceiling in the room have the same temperature. All right. What is the initial rate of cooling from the top surface by convection? So somebody says, I want to calculate how much cooling there is from the top surface. Well, it wouldn't it be an H from the top, an area of the top, times the temperature of the surface minus the temperature of the fluid? That looks like easy calculation. Yeah, well, all the work is right here, isn't it? It's not in the area. <laughs> That's pi d squared over 4. And the two temperatures were given. How am I going to get the convection coefficient for a hot plate, a round circular hot plate, sitting in this air. Well, I'm glad other people have studied this problem before us. 
because they say, okay, we've got this plate sitting here, and if it's hot, what does the air on top of it do? It'll, the cooled air will sink, get warm, and buoy up. And then it'll be like a jet stream of warm air here, but then some cold air will be coming down in locations, and then you'll get this natural convection that'll cool it. Maybe it's not very large in diameter, and maybe it's just falling in the middle and then going up on the sides, not too complex, or maybe it's a lot of little pockets of falling and then collecting. And they say, well, use this as a characteristic length that's described in equation 929 of the textbook, which is for this buoyancy-driven flow. It's the area of the surface. This time it's a disk, pi d squared over 4 times the perimeter. That would be pi d. So we cancel, 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 cancel d over 4. So you have your characteristic length. We have to go scour through all of these equations, find out which is the appropriate one. So I have a hot plate with cold fluid falling down. So the upper surface of a hot plate that's, that's it. That's, what, that's how the, you phrase it. And so you say, well, I'd like to use this equation. Uh, I take a look. I have to calculate the Rayleigh number using this length scale. The length scale is 0 0.05 meters. Probably a few people have already calculated that. And we want to calculate the Rayleigh number based on that length scale. The equation is G beta delta T L cubed divided by nu alpha. I have to get the right film temperature to evaluate my fluid properties. So the film temperature is just simply the temperature of the plate plus the temperature of the fluid divided by 2. Okay. When I calculate the film temperature, it comes in for this problem, 450 Kelvin. Right? Then I go to my air table. We did this last time. Get on the right line for 450 Kelvin and read off and be careful not to get off on the wrong line because we're going to need nu. Do you think nu is 32.39 meters per second squared? Or do I need to take into account this 10 to the 6 in the header of that column? I think we better take into account. So we put times 10 to the minus 6 meters squared per second. Yeah. And then likewise, the thermal conductivity. It's not 37.3. The thermal conductivity is 0 0.0373 watts per meter Kelvin because it is 10 to the 3. And then you're going to need nu. And I don't know if you need mu, but you need nu and mu. Nu and alpha and K and Prandtl number, et cetera. Okay. So we go back here, and I know there's a little bit of work, but you have to calculate the Rayleigh number with that rate length scale. And uh, I checked that it was in this range, and then what I did was I plugged it into this equation, and I calculated the Neusselt number for the top to be 13.273. I know too many digits, but once I have the Neusselt number, I want H on the top, don't I? That's the Neusselt number times the thermal conductivity divided by L. I just unravel the Neusselt number. And so it comes in, the H comes in off the top of 9.9 .9 watts per meter squared Kelvin or degree C, either one, temperature difference. About 10. It's good. It, it's, you solve a few of these problems, you get a sense of the magnitudes, good. If it came in at 900, I'd look for my error. If it came in at 0 .009, I'd look for my error. About 9? Good. So what we can do is go back here, 9.9. .9, the area is pi d squared over 4. Temperature difference is the um, 280 minus 75. And you calculate 63.8 watts. All right, how about from the bottom? Well, what we have is a hot plate, hot plate, right, and the cool fluids on the bottom. So actually, hot things like to collect in the ceiling, don't they? You ever been on a ladder in, in a building or someplace and you go up in the elevation? Like if I went up to the top here 
if the HVAC system's not blowing cold air or anything or running, it would, you could feel the difference in temperature if it's just stagnant. Uh, it would uh, create some uh, temperature profile. How about in a house? Maybe you've been in a house and the AC's not running and you go up near the top and it's like, whoa, a lot hotter up here. Okay, same thing. It, this is going to give you a lower H. So you refined the correlation where you have the lower surface of a hot plate. You use this correlation. It doesn't look a lot different. But when you calculate the Nusselt number for this case, it comes in not 13, but it comes in 6.74. And the convection coefficient on the bottom is not 9, but about 5, 5.03 watts per meter squared Kelvin. You've got to be able to run those numbers using the properties like the film temperature, and you should verify that. So when you come over here, you get a lower value of 32. Again, it likes to just sort of collect and sit there. Okay. The top and the bottom by thermal radiation. How are we going to do that? Well, we have the Q for radiation. I'm going to have put a 2 for the top and the bottom. I'll put the area of just one of them, pi d squared over 4. This area is pi d squared over 4. We'll put this emissivity of the surface, 0.7, how it, well it emits. The Stefan Boltzmann constant, 5.67 times 10 to the minus 8 watts per meter squared Kelvin to the fourth. And then we put in our absolute temperature of the surface, which is radiating. That one is going to be 553 Kelvin to the fourth power. Let me just put TS to the four minus T surroundings to the four. Isn't that our Stefan Boltzmann equation modified for the exchange between two surfaces, one large and black, like the room, the surroundings, and the surface itself with its emissivity? And then again, you put in absolute temperature uh, 553 Kelvin, absolute temperature 348 Kelvin, and you calculate 197. Now, you take a look, you add them up, this is 292 watts total by convection and radiation. The 67%, two-thirds of it is by thermal radiation. Again, thermal radiation when you have natural convection is often not negligible. You need to account for it. Because the convection, thermal, uh, natural convection is so um, often very low. And then if you look at these two, this, this is 11% and 22%. You know, it's twice as much off the top as the bottom because it, it wants to sweep it off the top. And it just wants to stagnate underneath on the bottom. All right. Hopefully that was insightful or helpful. Any comments or questions on that problem? Good. Should we press on? Why does a lake freeze from the top? I talked about that. Let's leave that one alone. All right. Sometimes you have natural convection, or often you have it in enclosures. And this one is a common one where you have a rectangular cavity where one side is at a certain temperature and the other side is at another temperature, T1 and T2, right here. And uh, this is like two window panes, right? Uh, and you have a small gap. Keep that small. When you have a double pane window, they have two panes of glass. They trap the gas in between. Often they backfill with argon. And they keep it small, but not so small that conduction is high, not so large that natural convection is high. The engineers work on it to pick the right gap. And they backfill again with argon. Often that helps it remain more stagnant, more stationary. Okay. Well, they've worked on it, and they really only have a single H for the whole problem. They'll put it in a Nusselt number, but when you unravel the Nusselt number, you don't get an H to get it let's say, from one pane into the fluid and then another H to get it over there. It's just from this T1 to this T2 in a thermal network, you just have 1 over HA, this single H to move it from one surface to the other surface through that layer of enclosed fluid. Well, let's take a look at the correlation. Do you see that it's a Nusselt 
as a function of Rayleigh, Prandtl, and then you have this geometry. Notice that this equation works for H over L between 10 and 40, a wide range of Prandtl number, a wide range of Rayleigh number. This equation works for a little larger range, H over L down to 1, but also up to 40, a narrower range of Prandtl number, and a, uh, you know, you just have to check those Rayleigh number, 10 to the 6 to 10 to the 9. Okay, here's the problem. A vertical double pane window, it's just like we talked about. You have a rectangular enclosure, and you have gas inside. Okay, it's got this um, height, height, both are 0 0.6, 0 0.6 meter. And L is this gap of uh, 0.025 meters. And it's filled with air, so we can get the properties easy. Otherwise, it's, you got to look up argon or other properties. It separates the room air. Let's say the room is over on this side at 25 degrees C from the outdoor air, outdoor air at negative 10 degrees C. The interior convection coefficient, so there's some convection on the inside, is 8.3 watts per meter squared Kelvin. And... The, the, the convection on the exterior is 34 watts per meter squared degree C. These values, maybe they're not in our textbook, but they're in other books. They represent winter conditions on a home where the wind is blowing at an average of 15 mile per hour on the outside of the home. And it's a quiescent indoor air. It's not really stagnant, but it's moving so that you get a little higher. It's about 8.3 watts per meter squared. These are good values. Neglect thermal radiation exchange and neglect the conduction inside the glass pane itself. If you can prove it, and the book does a good job of proving it, it's small. Estimate the heat loss through the window. So we want to know Q through the window. We put set up a thermal network. We'll have the temperature of the indoor air, that's 25 degrees C. We'll have a convection, 1 over H inside area, the window. We'll have this resistance through that enclosure where the air gap is. That's a 1 over H A as well. This is the temperature of the pane 1. This is the temperature of pane 2. And then we'll have the temperature to the outside, which is, get this out of the way, which is a negative 10 degrees C. And this is 1 over H on the outside area. So we're given the convection on the inside right here. We're given the convection on the outside right there. We have to get the convection for the natural convection in that gap. How do we do it? Well, we're going to use the equations that we had. So we jump back here and we say to ourselves, uh, I need to get uh, the Rayleigh number. For this problem, what is my length scale for the Rayleigh number calculation? It's, it's right there. What was it? 0 0.025 meter. All right. So let's go ahead and uh, this is a little bit of a challenge, but I need to figure out uh, the, the Rayleigh number as a function of L is G beta delta t l cubed divided by nu alpha okay g is known beta is one over the film temperature what's the film temperature it's what's my average temperature for the air in that pane we know it's over here what was it 25 degrees c and out here was negative 10 degrees c these are the words you don't like but it's the reality what do you think i'm gonna say I don't know what temperature the pane is. I can't get the film temperature. I don't know how to get the properties because they're temperature dependent. What do I do? Guess and iterate. Yeah, I know. So we'll say maybe it's uh, 20 degrees for the first pane, and maybe it's, uh, I don't know, negative um, 5 degrees C. Oh, you're going to guess. And now you're going to say, what's my film temperature? You're going to have... Uh, um, 20 plus negative 5, that's a 15, divided by 2, about 7.5 degrees C. Add 273 to work in Kelvin, and go get my 
my uh, nu and my alpha, and I'll need my thermal conductivity as well, as, as well as Prandtl number. <coughs> okay? I didn't say it was pretty, but you have to do that. Okay. Uh, once I get a Rayleigh number, I want to check to see if this correlation will work. Let me do this. Um, this will, will come in after you iterate. It'll come in around 17 and a half degrees C. And this one will come in at around negative 8 degrees C. All right. And so you, you can get a film temperature in the gap of around um, 278 Kelvin, the temperature film. You can go get your fluid properties. Then you can calculate the Rayleigh number, and it comes in at 5.31 times 10 to the 4. Does that work in this range? Yes. Our uh, height to length ratio, I didn't check that, was 0.6 divided by 0.025. That's 24, right? Does that work in this range? Yes. And my Prandtl number, well, it's about 1. It's close enough. Okay? So we can use this correlation right here. When you use that correlation right there, you calculate the Nusselt number, average Nusselt number, comes in 2.45. And then you calculate the H. We've done that a couple times. And you get that it's 2.4 watts per meter squared uh, Kelvin. It's low, but that's the purpose of holding that air stagnant. Okay? Try to hold it stagnant there. So that we did a lot of work to get that H of 2.4. So let me jump back here. So we get this 2.4. This one was what? 8.3. This one was 34. The areas are 0.6 times 0.6. All the areas are the same. You calculate the total R. The total R comes at 1.5737 degrees C or Kelvin per watt. Summing those three resistors in series. And then you can calculate the Q. Okay. Now, you know how to prove it that this, if I covered this up, said, I don't know that temperature, how would you calculate the temperature of pain one? It's really the, the yeah. It's, it's a, you, know, you just calculated Q so you could focus on this resistance and you could calculate TP1 is equal to TI minus Q divide, uh, times that resistance, right? That's one way that works. So there's a couple of ways. Um, we, that's kind of going back to what, chapter two or three? Likewise, this other temperature at the, the other pane. Does that look good? Have I put you to sleep? Are you okay? Okay, I'm worried about you. Some of you are yarning. Oh, yeah, remember, I have to look up properties. This problem was nasty because you have to guess and iterate. And the increment in our textbook is pretty large in the air tables. So you have to really do some interpolation. The other strategy when you have enclosures is to use effective conductivity. So here is we have an inner cylinder and an outer cylinder at different temperatures. And because the one may be hot, the other cold, you have flow pattern. As it's shown, which one do you think is hot? Looking at the direction of the arrows in the flow pattern. Which one is hot? The inner one is hot just by looking at the flow pattern. Okay. So they say, use this for the characteristic length. How did they come up with it? A lot of work. I don't know. Somebody did a lot of work. Then use this equation where they put K effective. I like to put this right over here. K effective is a multiple of the stagnant gas conductivity by this factor. That factor is going to be greater than 1. It's like boosting it by mo motion. And so you calculate that factor knowing the Rayleigh number and the Prandtl number. 
So uh, sometimes students go, Professor, what is this K-E-F-F? It's too simple almost. It's effective conductivity. It's a ratio of, because of enhancement, because of the natural convection, it boosts the, the, as if it was stagnant times this factor. And then you just use it in your conduction equation. All right. Uh, I didn't think I had enough time to solve another problem. I solved two tough problems here. I know I skipped some of the steps. In the interest of time, please solve your, these problems. But um, we skip this last section for sure, and I skim some other things. But look over the chapter again. We find a Rayleigh number to drive the flow. It's going to be based on some length. Well, often we have to find the right length for that correlation. Then we use a, a correlation to get the new number, knowing the Rayleigh number and the Prandtl number and the geometry. And then we unravel to get H is equal to the new salt times the thermal conductivity divided by the characteristic length, the appropriate length scale. And that's the whole game here. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>